The West Penra Papers A Journey Through the Multiverse The First Level of Learning http colon slash slash westbenry.com Solution Section Solution Paper Number 5, The Great Initiation By Wes Penra, Wednesday, August 31, 2011 Part 2 6. The Initiation Process Imagine a world which is stunningly beautiful, even more beautiful than the Earth we know. Imagine highly intelligent beings who are so highly evolved that they can move freely between densities and dimensions. There is no need to kill anybody because no one on this world is eating meat, they feed off of light and pure energy. There is no fear, because there is no reason to be afraid, there is no one who is threatening. Yes, there is an alertness an instinct to avoid dangerous situations which can harm even the high-density body, but if worse comes to worse and the accident is happening, the soul can just jump into another body, or create a new one, or have one created for them, because they are androgynous male-female. Also, they can travel through space and time quite freely, because they understand that they exist on many different levels of reality. There is no need for heavy-density spaceships or even higher density craft. They can travel without any other vehicle than their own body. So, what am I talking about here? Am I paraphrasing a science fiction book, or am I talking about us in a very distant future? Actually, it's none of the above. What I am describing is a distant past, it is us a long, long time ago, in a golden age in a version of Atlantis that existed in another density before the Atlantis Plato mentioned being swept away with the deluge. I am indeed paraphrasing, but not from a science fiction novel, but from the most recent book by David Ick. He doesn't mention where he gets his information from, whether it is channeled, a communication with his oversoul, sensory data streaming, or perhaps all of it. Still, it doesn't matter, because when I read this part of his book, Shortly after it came out, it confirmed almost to the word what I already felt inside was the truth. I don't care how many people say that we were upgraded by the Anunnaki when they landed here and started manipulating our DNA, I instinctively and very strongly feel that this is a big lie. I always did, and I couldn't explain why. I read Sitchin and found his series of books highly interesting and it felt like it was right to the point many times, but something was missing. It's like when you have this higher knowledge about something, but you can't prove it. You just know it's true. Not only did Ick acknowledge what I felt, others, like Asha Yanadine and her Guardian Alliance did the same thing, as did Lissa Royal and Keith Priest, and the Pleiadians. I basically found that most metaphysical sources, or at least the ones that are credible, indicate the same thing that we were highly evolved beings before the Anunnaki came and chased the original planners of the living library away with warfare and atomic weapons. I strongly advise you to read The War of Gods and Men by Zachariah Sitchin, you don't need to read many pages until you realize that this alien species is a highly disturbed race, and what's described in the book of what they did to each other and to humans can be quite an upsetting read. I, for one, have this strange feeling that a big, important lie was inserted into their own part of the history of Earth when they mentioned the visions of Galzu, this mysterious being whom supposedly planted seeds into the Anunnaki minds that they need to leave us humans alone and give Earth to us. In Sitchin's translation of the Sumerian tablets it says that King Anu, the previous king of the Anunnaki, eventually realized that the A.A.M.I were only emissaries for the human species, and humankind is destined to inherit the Earth and make it their own. Anu now believed it was his and his people's job to educate them and give them knowledge so they can advance. Then, when they were educated enough, the Anunnaki should leave the planet. This lie I believe was put there so that it could be used a few thousands year into the future, which would be about now, to serve them when they return so that humankind think they come in peace. I am even doubting that Galzu ever existed, it reads like a bad B-movie script. Anu would suddenly realize that Earth belongs to us after all the wars and the terror and destruction they've created over the span of millennia because of a couple of unusual circumstances? Come on! Anyone with any knowledge into how the mind works knows that someone with so many destructive acts on their conscience in an area would never just come to their senses like that. 
It's not credible. Use discernment and common sense here. The gods that took over the real estate were highly sexual to the degree that they even used sex for control, and it seems like they were actually the ones who made us sexual beings from had been androgynous and multidimensional. So did the gods really come here to mine for gold and precious metals? Yes, there is a lot of physical evidence that they did. That part is certainly true, but they were also conquerors and came here to expand their empire and to take charge of something that was located in the center of the earth. This is something I will expose in details later. For now, let us just say that they stole something more than just the living library and our DNA, they also stole and safeguarded what could have set us free again, something located in the center of the earth. In my papers, first level of learning, I have introduced Sitchin's version of history, and in the second level of learning I will introduce the extended versions of what really happened, so stay tuned. It will be a jaw-dropping adventure to read. So it's not that I'm taking my claims out of the blue. I have taken part of evidence that shows a much richer and fuller story. 6.1 The Fall from Grace But how did we become trapped like this if we were such highly evolved beings? After all, I said it was a CO creation? We have all heard about the fall of man and the fallen angels. I think the reader knows who the fallen angels are and how they came down to earth to interbreed with humans, genetic manipulation, but also from pure sexual desire and an inner drive to dominate. When they did, and deactivated most of our DNA, we fell from grace, like the Bible talks about. I think Mahunahi, James, of the Wingmakers is getting pretty close when he described in an interview with Carrie Lynn Cassidy and Bill Ryan of Project Camelot how Anu and his cohorts, the master manipulators, remember, lied to us and manipulated us into taking third density bodies in a nutshell, I believe the following is more or less what happened. The A.A.M.I. Landed on Earth, knowing that it was already occupied by highly evolved beings who were still working with their original creator gods, who had seeded them more than once. Earth was a planet of peace and had already started on its mission of being a living library, but it was under construction. The A.A.M.I came down in spaceships, fully armored and ready for war. For a while, they coexisted with the original planners, but they had no intention to share the real estate with other cosmic races. If the original creators didn't voluntarily leave the planet and signed over the real estate to the A.A.M.I, they were going to be forced away from the planet. The original planners did not give up so easily, and although they were not prepared for a fully blown up war, they did what they could to defend themselves and the living library. However, the builders lost the war after the Nibiru and human reptilian hybrid A.A.M.I. Species had nuked them a few times, and the original planner had to leave, although they never ever gave up on us. They are still around, taking every opportunity to help out. But why couldn't other races who saw what happened, intervene? Well, some did but one misconception is that the A.A.M.I are working alone. This is not true, there is a whole galactic federation which is supporting them. So we're peeling off one lie and withhold after the other here. At this point in time, the Anunnaki were simply too powerful, although those supporting the builders waited for the right moment to remove the intruders. What happened next made it more or less impossible to intervene, though. There may be a chance that the Anunnaki workers they used in the mines, and as slave labor in general, were a faction of the Zeta Greys, a hybrid biological artificial machine cloned race used by many beings as their working ants. There is also some evidence that the Anunnaki and the Greys are working together up to this day, as do the Dracos, a faction of the Orion Reptilians, originating from Earth, and another faction of the Greys. The Anunnaki lords knew that the Zetas slash slave labor were too weak to endure the hard mining job for any longer period of time, and it was too much of a hassle to patch them up or clone them. So they aimed for us, the highly evolved beings of Earth. Let's ponder this story, the Anunnaki kidnapped some of the evolved humans and began experimenting on them in their genetic laboratories here on Earth and on Mars. At first, they mixed the human genes with horses to get a strong species, and we got the centaurs, and they went on and created some quite horrendous species in the process, 
until they finally got a good 3D prototype. In the beginning they cloned them and put them to work in secret locations, perhaps on Mars or in remote areas on Earth, away from scrutiny of the evolved humans. They quickly understood that the cloning process took too long and they needed this former androgynous race to mass produce again, preferably as two sexes. So the experiments went on until they had a prototype they thought would work. Hundreds of thousands of years had now passed since the builders were forced to leave our planet, and the evolved humans had learned to intermingle with the Anunnaki, although I'm sure they weren't really buddies. These humans respected the Anunnaki presence, but were still naive and trusting, because this was the nature of these beings. So, the Anunnaki had a plan. In the bio-mind of the genetically manipulated 3D human, they inserted a lot of pleasant pictures, almost like a CD running over and over of a very beautiful and exiting reality. They manipulated a few evolved human souls to jump from their own bodies to this new, 3D body just to try it out. When they did so, this CD started playing in their heads, and as very pleasant emotions were also implanted in the brain of the 3D prototype, those who tried it out experienced it as very pleasant and exiting. At first, they were allowed to jump back into their original, lighter density bodies. Rumors spread quickly, because this early human race was pretty psychic and could feel each other's emotions on a distance, on a sub-quantum level. The Anunnaki understood this. So, the more humans tried out these new bodies, the higher the overall excitement, even amongst those who hadn't tried them. The Anunnaki, whom did not have the range of emotions that this higher evolved human species had, also had, and still have up to this day, the ability to cloak or copycat emotions of those in the environment, and could thus probably deceive the humans. The Anunnaki were pleased and went back to the laboratories. Now, they reconstructed the bio-mind of this new creature they'd created to include a soul trap. Once a soul attached itself to one of these bodies, it couldn't leave. A program embedded in it kept the soul glued to the body until the body died. There was also another mechanism implanted in this new version, sending out low-frequency waves which included a message that evolved humans from all over the place should come and get one of these bodies. The plan worked almost without glitches. Evolved souls got trapped into a number of clone 3D bodies and now found themselves unable to move away from them. This is possibly where basic claustrophobia comes from. The rest of the evolved souls, who couldn't get one of these new bodies, because there weren't enough of them, soon realized that their fellow man had been trapped, and as they did not know of warfare, they instead decided to leave the planet and go elsewhere, while part of their mass consciousness stayed trapped here on Earth as a slave race to the Anunnaki. At that moment the rest of the evolved humans left the planet, Earth devolved into a third density planet, because this was the new, lower frequency humans were trapped in within their bodies. The Anunnaki scientists, such as the Inki and Ninhursag had created a new species with only two strands of DNA, which very significantly reduced the abilities of this new race. 6.2 Rising from the Fall Although we can say that we were deceived into taking these lesser evolved human bodies of a much heavier, denser kind, it was a CO creation from the perspective of the multiverse. We agreed to do it, and therefore, there was an agreement, and no one could any longer tell the Anunnaki to leave the planet, it had become their real estate because we decided we liked this new body and eventually got trapped in it and became property of the Anunnaki. Not until we rebel in a sort of revolution of the mind can we break free and take the real estate back. The ancient agreement we have with the Anunnaki is still valid, until we decide that the agreement is broken and we want to regain sovereignty over our biokind and bio-minds. This must be done peacefully, though, or it won't work. Some readers by now may feel quite upset and want to go to war against the PTB and the Anunnaki lords who control them, and us. This is a natural reaction, but first of all, we stand no chance against them. We can't unite ourselves to the extent that we can overthrow them worldwide simultaneously. If a rebellion or an uproar happens in one part of the world, and it most probably will when people in general start finding out, the resistance will effectively be taken care of, and many people will die. Many others, who hear about an exaggerated version on the news, become fearful enough to withdraw from further resistance, and the PTB, 
with their military, made an example of a few. You may argue and say that people have succeeded in Egypt and Libya just recently. It may seem that way, but like one of our former U.S. presidents allegedly said, in politics, nothing happens by accident. If it happens, you can bet it was planned that way. This is very true. And I would add, that on a higher level nothing happens by accident, it's well planned. There are different races of ETS who are competing over Earth right now. So in certain terms, we also see a changing of the guards, or changing of the puppets. You may think that if being deceived into an agreement is a valid way of making agreements in the universe, it is a very unfair and hostile universe. However, we live in a free will universe where everything goes as a part of a bigger experiment, but everything that you do is coming back at you in form of karma. This is how the universe balances itself and makes each of us learn and expand our consciousness. And agreements that are seemingly unfair are often made on a much higher level of existence and not in the density they play out. Even most of the alien abductions done by apparent malevolent greys and others have an agreement attached to them. It could be an agreement made in a higher dimension or density, or a manipulated agreement, where the greys ask for permission before they abduct you, but in a way that it sounds like you are doing yourself and slash or humanity a favor. If this was happening spontaneously, seemingly without any previous soul agreement, it is still part of the abductee's learning lessons perhaps a lesson to learn how to say no, or to see through manipulation. Sometimes the universe is a tough teacher. Violence feeds violence always. If you use the sword, you will be destroyed by the sword. This is old wisdom. We are not here to combat or otherwise fight the dark forces, we are here to spread light into the darkness and make the darkness disappear by inner light work. We have a chance in approximately 26,000 years to break free from our chains and create the Golden Age once again. We have been aligning with the Galactic Center now, more or less since 1987, which was the beginning of the nanosecond, and all you need to do is to be here and be available for the download of gamma ray information into your DNA, and use your increasing consciousness and awareness to be an example for others. Those who are not yet understanding what is happening will look at you in wonder and ask you how you can be the way you are. From where did you get all your wisdom? All that love you hold in your heart for everybody, where did it come from? People will ask you these questions, and they do all the time with me, I guarantee you. When you can hold your frequency most of the time in spite of chaos around, people will feel that you are different and they want to be like you. Then you can explain to them what you are doing, and why. People will be in awe, because you may work at a gas station, at McDonald's, and still carry a wisdom that no professor in any university in the world comes close to. People will notice this. This is a major part of the initiation process, being able to keep the frequency. This is not as easy as it sounds. We all may get into this state of exhilaration on occasion, where we feel powerful and in love with everybody and everything around us. It's a wonderful feeling and a very high frequency. The trick is to keep this frequency, or a frequency close to it, most of the time when the world around us operates on a much lower frequency band. This is very hard work and learn step by step, little by little, until we can even it out on this high level. It is very possible, and I am able to do it most of the time. I have my moments when my frequency drops, but I am always able to raise myself quite quickly again and be where I want to be. If I can do it, anybody can, because I am not special in that way. Only difference between me and someone who can't do it is how much work we put into it. It's all about managing energy in spite of constant distractions and interference. Nothing is for free, if we want to regain our sovereignty over our biokin slash biominds, we need to raise ourselves above the crowd and take as many of the crowd with us by example and by being able to vibrate on a frequency that can raise other people as well. This is our duty. Once we're enlightened, we need to take the responsibility required. Wherever we go, we need to bring love and light into our environment, whether it's to the grocery store, a job meeting, or a place where there is a lot of chaos and darkness. Here is another part of the initiation, 
tell yourself that everything will work out better than best and everything in your present and your future will work in your favor. Your timelines will be healed because of what you do in this lifetime, and you will become whole and multidimensional again. In spite of disasters and catastrophes around you, you will be safe and like a big rock in the middle of a turbulent river, it will not affect you. You need to picture in your mind that all will be better than fine and feel it in your heart and your whole body. Let the body work with you, and stay grounded. You know that you are successful when you experience the following, on the news they are saying hurricanes and earthquakes are going to hit, one after the other, you notice that the end times are really approaching with all that goes with it, not so good aliens, presented as our saviors, will land and take control, you have no guarantees that your job will be there next week, and there is a logic possibility that if you get laid off, you have to go away from your home. In spite of all these threats which are present in an attempt to test you, to frighten you, you feel safe inside and know that you will be better than fine. You feel no fear, you find that fear is something you have overcome. Nothing can really shake you in the belief that you will be fine and better than fine no matter what, and you feel at peace inside. Instead of being terrified, you are able, in your peaceful state of mind, to calm others down around you, often without saying a word, your soul present may be all that's needed. You have already managed to stabilize your local earth and your local universe and by letting other people in, you will stabilize theirs too. This is exactly what we need to do. When things are going to really take off, people will be so terrified that they don't know what to do. People like us will be what's needed. We will find that our power to stabilize earth and people and animals around us will increase exponentially once these powers are really needed and our new potentials, which have laid dormant, will surprise even us. To how much help can you be? It is all equivalent to how much prep work you put into it before it all hits the fan. We are the new humanity. When the worst is over, the split will remain, some will stay in the false safety of the smart cities, while those who want to stay on the evolving track will find themselves more in nature, feeling the connection with all that is, and the density created due to our joint efforts will take us into a new density, a new earth. What may sound strange to some readers is the fact that it really doesn't matter what religion you subscribe to, if you're an atheist or a pagan, you can still evolve. It's your attitude to what is coming towards you in form of energy that is the measure. Are you willing to receive and learn? Are you willing to practice what you learn? Then, if you're a Christian, Buddhist, Catholic, or whatever, you will still be taking advantage of these extraordinary times. 6.3 It's all about numbers. 2 million people couldn't do it. 1 billion people couldn't do it. 7 billion could. We need numbers. On a level where games are planned and measuring of consciousness calculated, it was found out that Earth needs a population of around 7 billion people to be able to create the chaos necessary to regain order. We need a great catalyst to pull this off, and we have it now. The Pleiadians tell us that there are many, many more souls watching this earthly drama evolve, wanting to have a body at this time, than it is people on the planet. So if you have a body right now, here on Earth, you are lucky. Hence the importance to take care of it because we need it to evolve. The Pleiadians also say that we have, at this time, reached about the maximum of people incarnated on Earth, from now on the number will be reduced. This will be done through war, natural and man-made disasters and catastrophes, and cosmic influence to name a few. Still, we now have what we need to have the possibility to raise the frequency on our planet. Many who incarnated at this time did not do so to evolve, they just wanted to help out and be part of the enormous flow of energy dancing around on Earth in the end times. There will be a lot of people exiting their bodies before 2012 and shortly after. People will suddenly get sick and die, or exit in other ways. We're going to see a decrease in the population. Others are here to be our direct catalysts, they will be of darkness for us to be able to see the light. There are those who are asking me how you can love those who do harm to others, and once again, it has to do with the bigger picture. I do not agree with their actions, in the sense that I would never do it myself, and it causes much suffering. I know that this is not a popular viewpoint, 
but I will say it anyway, the suffering on the physical level is necessary for us all to take the next step further. Those of darkness are those who make the biggest sacrifices. It takes a lot of courage to decide to play that role, because their karma will hit them very hard, and their suffering before they can evolve will be worse than the suffering they caused to others. Would you like to be one of them? I, for one, am not brave enough to, still, without them we wouldn't know that there are higher realms to reach. None of us likes to see suffering in others. We automatically feel the urge to help, and there is no reason that we wouldn't. However, the difference between a person who yet hasn't seen the light and one who has is that, the first normally does all the work in helping the other one until they have made sure the other person is okay and then call it finished. The enlightened person normally does the same thing, except before leaving the person whom we helped, he does what he can to make that person aware of that there may have been a reason for what happened and that there may be some learning lesson connected with it. This way, it's help to self-help, and if we manage to have the other person see this, we can leave him or her and know that they came out of it with a new insight, and perhaps this person does not get into the same situation again. At least we made them think. So. Whatever you decide to do this lifetime, if you're here, you are here to contribute to the rays of consciousness on this planet, whether you're aware of it or not. The energies are such that all contribute in their own way, and it's the number of souls being here now that matters. Those who have decided not to develop spiritually will choose other paths, or exit, but they still assist those who have. My job is to wake up those who did decide to evolve but are so caught up in life that they more or less have forgotten, or were led astray. Maybe something I say will trigger those who are still not totally awake, or are slightly off task. For others, these papers will be a confirmation of who they are and what they already know. Perhaps even then, there is a section or two which will contribute and be a springboard on their journey. 7. Service to others slash service to self I believe that since people in the spiritual movement read Hidden Hand, and perhaps after that got familiar with the RA material, they consciously started practicing service to others, sto. So did I, not being familiar with this concept before 2008. First indicator that not everything was as it should was the emails I got. People started asking me questions about this. If they were doing this or doing that, was that service to others or service to self? Not only did people misunderstand the concept, but there was also fear involved, they were so afraid they weren't in the 51% category 22, and therefore were either going to perish or have to relieve the whole three density cycle again. Afraid is probably not the correct word, some people who wrote to me were on the brink of terror. Reminded me too much of a certain religion, where you go to a particular warm place if you don't stay in the fold. Same fear. So let us straighten this out, once and for all, and build the case in reference to the RA material, but also other material which is highly relevant on this subject. How do we know exactly when we are service to self and service to others? Before we discuss that I need to emphasize the misconception here, which probably has created a lot of anxiety in people, just like it does for a Christian who doesn't know if they will be part of the rapture or not. Many seem to think that now that they know about service to others, STO, and service to self, STS, they have to be available for everybody at all times and sacrifice themselves in the effort. The more they sacrifice themselves, the closer to 51% they are. As soon as they hear about someone who needs some kind of help, they need to be there for them after have dropped everything they're doing. Then another person needs help right after, and then another one. When they're done, the first person, who notices that the STO took care of the problem from beginning to end thought this was convenient and asks for help again. After a while, the STO is so overwhelmed with helping people that there is little time for anything else. This, of course, is not right. How could someone go to such extreme? The answer is, as usual, fear, fear not to be a 51 percenter. Good people who have spiritual knowledge, want to be better people every day, so even in the above extreme, it's understandable. Now, let's clear these concepts up. Service to self, STS, number is when a person, or group, 
has decided, consciously, or subconsciously over time, to enrich their own well-being or power on dispense of others. They always ask themselves or others, what is in it for me? When they help they do so with this in mind to get something back that they really want. They are willing to give, but as little as possible, only if they get something back. Otherwise, they are not interested. If the reward is not big enough, it's not worth the effort, so to speak. It depends how much STS the person is, but for example, if they see somebody fainting on the street, they pretend they didn't see it and pass the person, looking the other way, unless a movie star is watching and by helping the person the STS can get the movie star's attention. Other than that, if there is nothing in it for them, why help? There are better things to do. This is the mentality in general of an STS. A criminal is always STS. He wants to get something for nothing by robbing others of their possessions or their lives. They take no responsibility for their actions. They don't know how to make a decent living by creating it, but have to steal from what other people created in sweat and tears and now call it theirs. In a twisted way, they think they deserve it. Others put themselves in power by stepping on other people's toes, or by being nice to the right people on their way up, just to fire them once they get into a higher position than the ones they used to be nice to. They are backstabbing when they can, if for no other reason than to earn respect, which is not really respect, but a way of inducing fear and terror in others around them. They have no remorse and think that the sneakiest person is the smartest, and therefore earns the position of power. They admire, and are jealous of people who are experts in tricking, deceiving, and making clever moves in dispense of others. They love brilliance and learn from it, but only so they can use it destructively. We all have traits of STS within us, or we wouldn't be here. STS is the ego, the analytical mind. It has to do with survival and logic. It's not a problem until STS gone wild and starts to dominate our lives. STS is always based on fear, fear of death and fear of not being able to survive, or fear of being alone. The ego feels it needs to dominate others to be able to survive in an eye for an eye, tooth for a tooth society. Deep inside, an STS who've gone wild is like a frightened little child, who doesn't have any means left to create their own lives, they have to suck the life energies out of others, they feed off other people's fear. They think they can put themselves in respect this way. They have no real friends, because most people fear them, and those who decide to stay by their side are always sucked out of energy and will sooner or later get very sick, and perhaps die, when the immune system is totally depleted. So, STS is nothing wrong, it's only when it's taken over our lives that we will be considered negative people and on the negative path. The PTB are STS to the extreme while normal people, who could be considered STS don't even come close to the PTB, not even the worst criminal we have ever heard of comes even close in comparison. Over and over you see these well-dressed people of high power being interviewed on TV, and you think nothing of it, but behind that neutral, or sometimes half-friendly facade, dwells a very sick and insanely dangerous person. Service to others, sto, number, most of us want to do good. We feel good when we are able to help others. When we are sto, we use our more of our heart chakra, the energetic heart, than our ego. Sto means that we are willing to assist others without expecting anything back. Sometimes we even prefer to help anonymously, although this is not required to fall into the sto category. Sto is not about always being available to each and every person who is in need. If you want to help someone, First be sure the person really wants help before you intervene. It's a fine line between help and intervention with another person's learning lessons. If there is an accident and a person lies bleeding and unconscious on the street, you don't first ask them if they need help, you just help them despite. This is obvious. I am talking about everyday life situations. You may see someone who seems to be in some sort of trouble, but that person doesn't say anything about it. The best thing to do would to first observe to see if this person A is capable of resolving her situation. If after a while you notice that person A seems to have handled it, just drop it. It was part of A's learning lessons, 
and she was fully capable of learning from it. In this situation it's quite important not to interfere. You may have the best of solutions and intentions, but person A needed to figure it out herself to be able to grow. If you solve other people's problems all the time, they don't learn as quickly, they will start relying on outside forces to be able to solve their problems, and this, more often than we may think, creates huge problems. We make this mistake with children all the time, and they grow up insecure, unwilling, and unable to solve their own problems. Here is another scenario, person B seems to have problems with her husband. She is giving you hints and she looks depressed without getting any better. You ask her if she wants to talk about it, and she does. You just listen to what she has to say without interrupting. While listening, you get the grasp of the situation and why it seems to be an unresolved issue. When she's done talking, you ask some questions if you need to, until you understand from the best of your ability. Then you repeat the important parts of her story back to her so she can see that you grasped it, and if you didn't, she will correct you. This shows her that you care and it creates confidence and trust. Now you tell her that the following is what you can see could be something she and her husband could work on, making sure she understands that this is only your viewpoint, based on experience, and from have seen other couples having a similar situation this is the conclusion you've come to. Ask her if this makes sense to her, or if she feels it doesn't apply to her situation. If it applies, give her advice, if you can, which helps her to see the bigger picture, but always when possible, give help with the intention to self-help. You know you were doing a really good job if you made that person see her situation from another angle and is now willing to resolve the issue herself, together with her husband. Tell her you will always be there in the background in case you can be or further assistance. If you notice that you don't have enough experience or knowledge in the area person A has problems, tell her so and don't give advice that is pure guess. If you can assist, do, but if you can't, tell the person that so she can get assistance elsewhere. Never feel bad because you were not able to help the way you intended. You were doing what you could and you were honest about it. Most people in today's modern society are more STS than they are STO. It's nothing wrong either way, but to raise our frequency, we need to be more positively oriented. We do this, of course, by helping others when appropriate, but there is one primary thing we need to do, which is more important than anything else if we want to evolve, and here is where the big misunderstanding lies, we need to raise our own frequency by working on our own spiritual and individual growth. This is the most important statement I have ever made. People have had this misconception that if you do that, it's STS. Hence, many are burning themselves out helping others with everyday things, and it takes all of their time. Suddenly, they are in a position where they have no time at all to work on their own spiritual growth. Here is an example where we are able to distinguish between good and bad channeled material, there are those who try to trick us by stressing we need to bestow but basically neglect and sacrifice ourselves in our efforts to help others with their daily life. This is disinformation. It is not STS to work on yourself, it's actually the ultimate stow. I have talked about this a lot already in my papers, but by raising our own frequency, we become candles in the dark, lighthouses on the shore. Others see the light and will follow. This is the quiet movement which will set humankind free. That's why it's so important not to interfere with someone else's progress and learning lessons. You may think you have the perfect solution for a person in need and can't wait to tell him. However, on occasion, when you do, the other person rejects and discards your obvious solution and instead chooses to do something else which in your eyes looks totally wrong. If this happens, you need to let it go because he has to learn his own way, even if he smashes his head against the wall again. This is particularly hard when you see your kids growing up and start making wrong decisions. Bear in mind, though, that there are no wrong decisions, only the next step on another person's journey. Let him learn in his own speed, or you'll slow him down even more. People make this mistake all the time without being aware of it, thinking they are sto. A very important subject. All you can do is to support your kids in their life decisions and give advice when asked for, 
and be there for them if something happens. But always remember, just because they are your children, they are not you. They may have your genetics, but their life mission is set out differently than yours sometimes way different and as parents we have to accept this. You are not here to force others to do things the same way you do them because it works for you. We are here to graduate from the third density, which requires personal work and a clear connection with our internet, our inner selves. We do so by learning how the multiverse works on a metaphysical level and to some degree on a quantum and sub-quantum level. We are here to realize that we all are one and therefore everything is connected, and what you do to others, you do to yourself. We are here to open up our chakras, and at this point in time, the heart chakra in particular, and the third eye as well. However, the heart energy is what will connect us with the multiverse. People may believe that they create their own realities, but when they see starving people, or babies that suffer, they suddenly change their minds and those who suffer now become victims and what happens now doesn't have anything to do with creating your own reality. This concept may be hard to understand for many, but there are no victims. Even those who are starving in Africa, and babies who are abused, are creating their own reality. When this is pointed out, I may sound emotionless, but I am certainly not. Although the above is true, it doesn't mean we are not feeling compassion. Still, when we buy into the victimhood mentality, we do these people a disfavor, depleting them of their own power, we say they have no power. How on earth are they going to get better if we have already given up on them? Even though it's extremely hard sometimes, we need to learn to honor other people's dramas and learning lessons, even if it's in the middle of a war zone, like with the everlasting conflict between the Israelis and the Palestinians. Why were certain people born in that area and not you? The answer is because people living there have lessons to learn, ancient karma to take care of, and they need to live it out and learn, and you do not. I'm not being judgmental, it's simply the work of energy. You read about it in the news and feel empathy with certain groups or certain people who are in dire straits, but it doesn't mean you want to, or need to, experience the same thing, it's not part of your own learning experience. Although, if you take the next plane over to a war zone and build a house there, then it is a part of your learning experience, you move from one earth to another because you consciously or subconsciously feel you need to take care of some karma on that collective version of earth. Many people ask themselves how it can be that a sweet, innocent baby or child is subjected to such tremendous horror. How can that be karma? The child hasn't done anything remotely proportional to what happened to her. This is always traumatic because we feel the need to protect our children. There could be many different reasons why a certain horrible situation happened to a child, it could be karma from other lifetimes, but it could also be soul agreements on a higher level something made in the astral. A certain brave soul decides to go through a particular traumatic incident which may even lead to an early death to help others have a learning lesson. When things of this nature happens, there is always a bigger picture. My series of papers are all directed towards this one goal, to help others open up their chakras so they can evolve and break the frequency fence. I am not a guru or a cult leader. I am not promoting any religion, dogma, or rigid ways of thinking, I leave it all up to the reader to interpret this and take to heart what will work for you. These are universal concepts and what is happening now is to a large degree normal evolution and nothing strange. Still, the way how to raise your own frequency is your own choice, I am only giving guidelines. Each one of us will find our own ways that work for us personally, and no one's path is better than another's. The end goal will be the same. Although I am a teacher in my papers, I am always a student as well. I learn something and then I teach it to others, but I am always both a teacher and a student. This relationship with self is never ending, because there are no limits to what there is to learn. Always feel gratitude for what you have. Find something in your current life to feel grateful for and express it. Thank the Prime Creator. Thank your Oversoul and your Spirit Guides for all their assistance, and acknowledge yourself for your progress. If you think of it this way, you will find more and more things to feel grateful for and you will grow. It's not about fearing whether we're good enough to ascend to another reality, 
it's about overcoming fear itself. Once we've done that, we have automatically made it. Important to say, though, is that it is perfectly in order to be afraid if you are on the African savanna and suddenly find yourself standing face to face with a wild lion, that's instinct, fight or flight, and that's when fear can come in handy. However, even then we can potentially control our fear as long as we are conscious of the threatening situation, because when we feel less fear, we think clearer, but also sends a signal to the lion that we are not afraid, we are powerful and not a threat to the lion. So in certain terms, overcoming fear also applies to the lion situation. On the other hand, you will find that when you fear less and less in life in general, even a lion situation would trigger much less fear in you than it did before. Still, the fear we're talking about in these papers is the induced fear by powers who want to control you, and those who want to keep us in check and ignorance. The saying goes, your power ends where your fear begins. Service to others, is not going out and martyring yourself and saying, I'm going to save you. Service is doing the work yourself and living in such a way that everyone you touch is affected by your journey. The Pleiadians It's perfectly okay not to answer your phone or ignore the doorbell when you feel you don't want to interact. You are the one who is setting limits and tell people what you are available for and not. Your inner work is always the most important and something we need to prioritize. Everything else, in these times, is secondary. Each one of us came to Earth at this time to do a task, and that time is now, today. Even if everything you are here to do is to just be here and contribute to the overall energy of the planet, that is very well and extremely helpful. And again, honor your friends and relatives as they go through their lessons, just don't get involved in it. Whatever you do, don't help in a way that will prolong their dramas. It is time for people to move through stuff and not for you to get involved in someone else's program, you have your own stuff to get through. If something happens to you and you need to talk to someone about it, tell them a couple of times or so, but don't dwell on it, and don't necessarily tell everybody you know and discuss it over and over. They have their own stuff to go through and what you are going through is not part of their reality. Always look at your situation, whatever it may be, and pick out anything you may find that could be a learning lesson for you and start learning from it. This is the advice you give to others as well, who are sharing their dramas with you. Tell them to look for learning lessons. The best you can do is to explain this to people, and although it may not be real for everybody, it's okay. You plant a seed of truth in the other person, and one day they will realize you were correct.